Hi all, I'd like to go into greater depth about a certain move choice uh, which was a major blunder in one of my games recently in London Classic, although I have gone over this game you know, quite swiftly over all the moves. Um, there was a move which was a basis for a philosophical discussion I had with Mike Bennett from Hendon, Hendon Chess Club during the tournament uh, between rounds about internal versus external quality, about strategic versus tactical considerations, you know, rule independence, dualism, static versus dynamic. Anyway, why, why this was all brought about was this, this notion that I had of a knight outpost chooser. And this, this was a symptom, really, that I really felt in this position I had two candidate places for this knight. Now, this was a symptom of, of a previous loss where I had, I don't know if you remember this Banco Gambit, where my knight was trapped. And I thought afterwards, wouldn't it have been nice if I had planned, you know, where to put the knight, you know, to, to go to e8, to c7, to b7, to d4. So from a previous loss, I had sort of tried to deduce a strategic consideration about where to place knights optimally. And this basically led to, to losing two moves here and, and, and getting crushed here as well. So it's interesting that sometimes you can deduce sort of uh, these conclusions, these rules in inverted commas, and they don't really apply in a particular position. So it's interesting, you know, why, why is knight e2 to g3 a lot better as an idea to get to e4 via, instead of just bishop e, e4 and, and knight d3? It's because of the specific considerations that actually the bishop on d3 is playing a very useful role in this position of defending c4. So as soon as I moved it, the opponent like pounces on on c4. He's got two choices, in fact, bishop a6 or knight b6, or even just you know delay that and just castle later. And he's also restraining my, my pawn structure on the queen side. But anyway, the the philosophy philosophy behind this is that. This this kind of rule, need, you know, it was. You need to look if you if you are going to have this this uh, conceptual knight, you know, chooser, where you're going to look at a position abstractly, and choose. Oh, you know, where would a knight look good? I think there's a key question which could be asked, which is, you know, is is the knight exploitable there, or is it, how exploitable is your position, or how exploitable is the opponent's position? Now, if the knight's on e4, you know. This is exploiting the dark squares, which means, you know, maybe if this bishop wasn't protecting d6 or f6, the knight could go into f6 one day. But also, you know, also, if, if um, to, to get there, it's, it's dislodging another piece. So if I have to, you know, by the same reasoning, if I think d3 is good and I have to move the bishop, then what is exploitable? Well, c4 is exploitable. So the question of exploitability um, kind of qualifies... The, the general concept, and the reason this this led to a discussion is because you know I I'd indicated to, to Mike that I remember reading Nimzvich a long time back um, ago, uh, a long time ago, uh, a lot about structural you know pawn weaknesses and weaknesses in general, and I, I you know I, I I told him that basically you know I had three or four losses in a row. Two or three years ago, after reading, you know, re-reading Nimzovich, because I, I was taking the pawn structure too literally and chasing after weaknesses which weren't really that exploitable, and I realised it, it, it came as a sort of epiphany that actually the, the the problem with my knight outpost chooser concept here um, is is the same sort of thing that um, the, the, you know if if you look at what knight outposts are exploitable. Uh, from from both sides, from your opponent and, and your side, then you're, you're attaching with it this this notion of context, and that that is is like um, you know looking at it from both a static and a dynamic perspective. That um, you know you can't just look at the knight on d3 in isolation to whatever else is going on wrong or or or, or, gr or great in the position, in particular c4. So that's why knight e2 to g3 to e4 is, is a more logical choice because it's it's not only static considerations but dynamic that white will still be able to defend c4 if if necessary. So th this idea of of blending um, you know static and dynamic is is also uh, you know a big debate uh, about. Um, 
you know, do do you play with positional considerations or dynamic considerations? And also, I think you know, do, you know, do you have optimism or pessimism? Because if you're optimistic, then maybe you you sort of accept rules and generalizations, you know, like placing your knights in the centre without sort of questioning them too much. But it's it's the pessimism which provides maybe the concrete calculation, you know, the cynicism, the spec, the scepticism. You know, do, do you really want your knight in the centre? You know, you, you have this um, creative ability then to to reject uh, generalizations, and these are not just generalizations you read. These these are generalizations which can be de deduced yourself from past games. So this question, you know, can you um, ca can you qualify your own generalizations first, let alone other people's generalizations? So that's why I wanted to just you know go over this that this. This idea of the knight outpost chooser in this particular example, you know, illustrates that, you know, the concrete of the position is really important to to assess. Um, and if you're, if you're interested, there's, there was actually a wider debate a few years ago. If you look up on Google the Watson defense, there, there's an amazing debate about rule independence uh, given by Watson. And Agard was going on about um, rule independence. So there were some, some, some disagreements there which were very interesting to have a look at, um, so so for example, um, that I quote that rule independence is in my book refers to not being dependent upon certain rules, abstractions, and generalities in practice. Um, but Watson argues that the phrase uh, doesn't imply that there is no truth in any generalization whatsoever. Uh, you know, he, he's he's just just saying that not being you know tied down to it. That modern players, for example, you know, undermining the pawn chain from its base. It might be more effective to undermine it from from the head of the pawn chain. Um, you know, in fact, even even in this game, you know, that if we look at this game as a general generality regarding pawn chains, it was a Watson innovation with knight b3. I was following instead of like routinely, you know, protecting the chain. It's actually called breaking the chain. So, it, in fact, the opening of this game was kind of a, a dynamic idea from Watson, and it, you know, this this modern shift. Um, you know this ability to question basically uh, general principles, give, given you know the, the specifics of, of the position. You know maybe this dynamism is being fueled by you know engine analysis and, and more modern you know analysis being more open-minded to all the possibilities which which are in positions. Um, so this open-mindedness uh, also applies, I, I would argue, to your own deduced concepts that you know always try and. Well, I, I personally will now try and look, you know, is it exploitable from both sides? Whatever concept you might deduce from past games, um, you know, don't, that, that might, you know, win you games when you, when you have, like, for example, a nice night out post chooser, but it might actually lose you games if you don't factor in the dynamics. And one easy way, I think, of factoring in the dynamics of the position is just say, you know, is it exploitable or not? And in fact, th this idea of might be free in itself was proven to be exploited by the opponent for gaining a tempo for restraining the A pawn later in this game. But this, this is only because, you know, I, I, I kind of misplayed it, really. I should have perhaps played C4 here in response to B6. So it, the, the knight on B3 did come, come to be a target later, and, and black had a great game. But that wasn't necessarily, you know, that was the follow-up that I had wrong, you know, incorrect. But this, this general idea that I wanted to convey in this video, that your own generalizations you know, also need to be qualified. You know, if you come up with this, as I, as I say, this notion of the night out post chooser, if you don't then attach questions to it in, in its application, then, then you're really going to lose a lot of games because of concrete um, considerations. So um, please leave any comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.